think of you as almost like the love child of David Bronner and Zach Bush. <laughs> you've got, yeah. With a light dusting of the happy pair twins, like you've got the conscious capitalism, sacred commerce thing going on. You've got the regenerative agriculture thing going on. And then you leverage these cafes, these restaurants um, to amplify this positive vibe that you're putting out into the world. And they serve as kind of these ground zeros, like the locus for all the things that you care about to mm. cultivate community and uh, provide you know, expansive wisdom for mm. the world. Like, how do you think about what you do? Um, wow, uh, thank you for that question uh, and for that, uh, that creation story uh-huh. <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, you could disagree. Yeah, no. Um, y- you know, it, it, the way that I, the way that, um, one, I just, I've had an incredibly privileged life. Um, just in the extraordinary um, parents uh, and that I've gotten to work with my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say that, yeah, really my, the way I see it is I've had an extraordinarily um, uh, lucky life and upbringing and opportunity and access to people and things uh, and information and really part of my struggle has been how do I best use, uh, that privilege to be, um, to, to, to serve and to contribute. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would say that the big kind of essence of my life and the crux of my life has really been, uh, how do I be the presence of love such that everyone I come in contact with, they're left with, uh, that love was not, uh, not something that was found, but actually is something that we embody and that we, we offer and we give. That, you know, that was kind of the biggest spiritual epiphany of my life was that love is not something found in a person, place, or thing. It's something that is, and we've heard many versions of this before, but it's something that is ever present in our heart and it's always available as a gift and yeah. it costs nothing to share it. And yes, we have lots of things that get in the way of that, but as, as you know, I think if, if I was to die tomorrow, what I would want people to know and what I would hope that I demonstrated um, to, uh, to a fair amount of the interactions that I've had would be like, wow, there was there was love present uh, that was being given freely from that human being. Mm. So difficult to hold on to that. <laughs> so difficult. Sliding sands in the fingertips. Yes. Oh my I god. Know. Well, your Twitter your Twitter bio kind of says it all, right? Your Twitter bio is unconditional love, remembering the unconditional part. Mm. That's the hard part, right? The unconditional yeah. part. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thank you for that lesson that I I, I I said and thought and you know many many years ago when I wrote that, uh-huh. um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, really, I would say that what Cafe Gratitude, what Kiss the Ground, everything that I'm doing, uh, really is uh, how to connect to that brilliance and that uh, spirit of uh, love. Mm. And then take action guided from that. And I, that's, where does where does this come from? I mean, this does this come downstream from amazing parents? Like, where does that sensibility emanate from? Yeah, uh, definitely. Where m- many people, I think, had a relationship to specific religions or spiritualities. Really, what I remember of my upbringing was. Basically, the the um, the communication was that we were we're all we're all cells in one body, and that there's this um, yeah that we're all, that we're all one. So how do you take action, and how do you treat 
each other and the earth, knowing that where they are, you are there too. So how would you treat, how would you um, be towards them? Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was like a foundational piece. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of rebelled and went away from my parents. I tried to become a pro snowboarder uh, right. a, for a couple years in Lake Tahoe and kind of had a, you know, I got to go figure out my life on my own. And then, um, you know, my sister got in a situation where she was um, facing life imprisonment um, based around a marijuana deal gone bad. Oh, I didn't know that. And I, I had basically had to, I left my life in Lake Tahoe, came to kind of be with her in LA to kind of get her through this moment. And that ended up going, turning into a, uh, we, we ended up opening a recording studio uh, in North Hollywood. So I had this whole career of like a hip hop, R&B. Really? Recording studio. How long ago I, was I, this? I used, to, I used to have like a, a like a like a kind of a, a a Puerto Rican chin strap and like wore Fubu velour <laughs> jumpsuits. <laughs> I have a very hard time visualizing that. And a, and a major no swagger. <laughs> How long ago was that? This was in 2000, 2000, 2000 yeah, when I was that, 20, 20, 20, 21, 22, and twenty three. Uh huh. Um, but at some point you found your way back to the family fold. Yeah, then, then that whole business fell apart and I actually had one a, a big moment of kind of humility and, and loss because we had built this recording studio. We had three recording studios in North Hollywood and we were totally hip to the scene of you know, urban hip hop music mm -hmm. and had a lot of uh, artists that, you know, we, um, you know, the Rough Riders, you know, like Jada Kiss was in wow. the studio, Ashanti was in the studio, B2K back in the day, you know, they were, uh -huh. so it was like this big moment. And then literally we lost everything. We had to sell our house that we had bought. And I ended up being like the host at Follow Your Heart in Canoga Park. Oh and I remember gosh. the first time one of the celebrities, this woman named Janae, who's like a, a, a budding R&B celebrity, like came in to Follow Your Heart. And I was like the, Thank you for choosing Follow Your Heart, this is Ryland. And she knew me as this young studio entrepreneur right. from a year before and just like the dying to my pride of. Oh my God. <laughs> How did, what happened? You just got upside down on it? Yeah, I mean, we, we basically took a huge, we took a huge loan uh, or owner financing for the building. We took a huge uh, loan on the equipment. It was like $500,000 worth of equipment. Our monthly net was like forty thousand dollars, and you know when Napster took you know the internet kind mm -hmm. of media share, sh music sharing became a thing, budgets, budgets went dropped. really went, and yeah. so there was no you could pretty much record something in a, a studio at home versus needing a, a big right. live room and this kind of thing. So that whole thing fell apart. Uh, and my sister went into a state of depression. I had to get a job and follow your heart. I was always into health food, oh, organic man. food. <laughs> For people that are listening, follow your heart is like super old school, uh, like an o the OG, like vegan macrobiotic restaurant slash grocery store, like deep in the valley. Been it's still there. there. I been, ate there recently. Yeah, I love been, it. It's been, great. But... Been there since the seventies. <laughs> uh, still yeah, has yeah. like the wood panel right. flooring. It looks exactly like it did back in the day. It has that that aesthetic. Yeah, like they, they were selling avocado and sprout sandwiches when it was 60 cents for yeah. a sandwich. Yeah, it, 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 I'm sure it was like the only vegetarian vegan restaurant in the whole area. And it's crazy, Follow Your Heart is now you know huge because vegan of vegan A's and all their assorted products. Cheese, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but yeah, we, where we were getting to was, um, and the other other things, you know, the other cool, you know, this is, I guess, full transparency. My folks took me to a um, a plant medicine ceremony at 19 years old, um, at a moment in my life when I was totally um, in identity crisis of what I was supposed to do. I didn't go to college because I had learning disabilities as a child. I had ADHD and attention deficit disorder and um, dyslexia. I had read it at like a fifth grade level graduating high school. And so I was, uh, and I didn't go to college because I didn't think I was equipped for further education. And then the whole dot-com boom was happening in San Francisco. I was living on the West mm. Coast and I was thinking I should get into that. Um, and. And you know, I was kind of in in conflict of where I should go and what I should do, and ended up ended up drinking ayahuasca um, with your parents. With my parents, wow. 
uh, and uh, yeah, I had this amazing, clear pathway, which was I saw my you know desire for you know fascination with technology or need to do that because that was a thing that where people were making money, and I just saw visually. Uh, you know, the kind of corrosive, disconnected, more disconnected nature that going down that road would take me and mm-hmm. take humanity. And I visually saw myself as this, uh, my, my hands, you know, as roots and my shoulders as the sides of the mountains and, you know, this protector of the earth. And in this, you know, very beautiful moment, experiencing myself as a being, as the earth, feeling that pulse of life from, you know, the earth and then experiencing even a th- another dimension of, you know, the view from the, the bird's eye view of, you know, me and the earth all experiencing itself as this, um, you know, one experience. And, uh, and it, what I came away with that my life was about protecting and caring for mother earth. Wow. And, and that's what you've become. That's what, yeah, yeah. That, that was a, a predecessing moment. Uh, and again, that, that there was, you know, many, 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 many years until, you know, kissed the ground. But, you know, again, the, the background of that was I was always, I always knew that plant medicine, whether it was echinacea um, or golden seal or, uh, you know, these different herbs or, um, you know, I, I was the type of kid who someone would get a sting, a, a bee sting, and I would go and find a plantain you know, weed on the, chew it up in my mouth and make a green little lump of, uh, and stick that on the bee sting and knew that it would pull the, (laughs) pull the, uh, Uh pull the poison out of the skin. Um, so I always, there was a background of it, but it became very, um, clear that that was what I was to, that, that was the master and the mother Mm. that I was supposed to serve. So growing up then, did you grow up on your parents' farm? Mm. I mean, your dad was originally like an IBM executive, right? And then like switch gears, like totally do I have that no, wrong? no, totally wrong. Yeah, like, that's uh, my, wrong? my dad actually didn't go to college. Oh, he didn't. My dad How was my dad was that? a back to the lander. Uh-huh. He spent three years in the Adirondack Adirondack Mountains in a teepee, cooking every meal on wood fire, uh, and then I was conceived right at the end of that phase when they were on their way to California in a, in a little hippie van uh-huh. to find their TM meditation teacher, their guru, a guy <laughs> named Charlie Lutz. Uh, I got conceived on that road trip you to the West Coast. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, right? Like if you scripted that or that was in a movie, you'd be like, there's no way. It's <laughs> too California. Totally. It's like too hippie. Totally. Wow. Um, so they ended up... <laughs> They ended up getting out there uh-huh. and then not being able to sustain themselves and because they were pregnant and they realized, oh, I have a kid on the way. We have to go back and get ourselves you know, sorted out. And so they ended up, ended up going back to um, upstate New York. We ended up, uh, my dad and his tw- brother married my mom and her twin sister. No way. So two brothers married sisters. Uh-huh lived in this, we had this little farmhouse in upstate New York on 21 acres uh, with a little pond, a little orchard. It was an old dairy barn. One, one pocket, but one bank account between the four. Uh-huh. And um, you know, that's, where, that's where we grew up. Utopia. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was- Grew up until how old? Uh, till 18. Oh, wow. So I went that, all through high school, it was, was in- Did you go to like a local high school or were you homeschooled? Um, we went to, I went to Waldorf school, uh-huh. uh, for the first, uh, till eighth grade. And then went to a alternative public school called ACS, mm. uh, which had courses, classes like radical American politics. And mm-hmm. you read Howard Zinn, <laughs> people's history. Right. Uh, wow. So how did they, how did, how did this group of four make their way? Uh, my dad was, he, he called himself, he was a piss poor carpenter, uh-huh. uh, like a B grade par, par, carpenter. Um, and uh, my uncle Scott, um, he raised dairy cows, um, and th- my my um, my mom's my aunt worked at the co-op, you know, Green Star Co-op, and my mom's first company was the Benevolent Bean, Jean mm-hmm. the Bean, and she made tempeh and tofu <laughs> as the first <laughs> business, uh, and they had a, a big uh-huh. soybean on the on the back of a, a van was their little their car. Um, 
and and then that kind of you know that was short lived, and then my dad uh, my dad and mom started a clothing business called Flax, right? Um, that was kind of their first success, mm-hmm. and they built that kind of from you know in the sewing room in our house to they were selling to thousands of retailers all across the country. Oh, wow! And is that where the affirmations began? Uh, the affirmations began with. Uh, my parents' different spiritual teachers. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a woman named uh, Jan Kinney or Jan Williams, and she was a big part of this whole idea that your life's a picture of your mind um, and that we are creators of our reality through our thoughts, speech, beliefs, actions, and attitudes. Uh, create our reality. And if we're just present to managing our thoughts, speech, beliefs, actions, and attitudes, you know, we can, you know, really have dominion um, Mm -hmm. in the experience of our life. Mm -hmm. And, and that spirit amplifies. If so, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm complaining, spirit is going to amplify that complaint into my reality. Um, Because spirit is, Neutral. It's just amplifying what we what we are putting our awareness on in the present moment, and so you know that. And that was an interesting thing because they got way deep into that work um, to the point where you know there was affirmations all over our house. My first name was uh, Regal Relating Ryland was uh-huh. my was my affirmational <laughs> name. Um, and so you're being <laughs> you're being indoctrinated into this from as far back as you can remember, totally. right? It's, it's kind of amazing that you actually didn't become like an investment banker. I suppose I, I I would I would imagine that the ayahuasca ceremony probably was the wrench in that plan because usually a kid that grows up in an environment that's so loose and progressive in that way ends up going in the opposite direction to rebel. Yeah. Um, needing to find structure because there was no structure. Right. Because there's chaos with that too. Totally. Right. There, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when you, but when you look back on that, do you like, what are you, what's your emotional reaction to it? I mean, you sound, I mean, you, you come across like you're very fond of that, the way you were brought up. Yeah, I, 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 I am. I, I, you know, I still, my relationship to both my dad and mom, even though my mom and dad have you know, divorced, they divorced uh-huh. uh, when I was 20. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I adore them. They're some of my favorite people in the world. I work with my dad with yeah. Cafe Gratitude. Uh, you know, he's a regenerative farmer. Uh, and yeah, he, we're, we're, we're each other's biggest fans. Well, I met them. I don't know if you remember this. We went to Thanksgiving at Gracias Madre. It's probably. Two years ago. Two years ago, yep. yeah. Yes. And you you guys put on this amazing experience where you had uh, Native American singers and dance. There was like all kinds of really cool stuff that was yes, going yes, on yes, that yes, day. Yes, and your yes. parents were there and I had a nice conversation with your dad. Yes, then we Incredible were- Incredible people. We, we, we were raising, every Thanksgiving we do a free meal for the community and we choose a cause to have, you know, it's like our way, you know, Thanksgiving, Cafe Gratitude, Gracias Madre, it's all about, mm. you know, thank, thankfulness, being thankful, being grateful. And so our way to kind of be who we say we are and, you know, really emanate like gratitude and generosity is we do a, a free day where we serve, you know, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 meals and we choose a cause to have, you know, we don't charge people, but we ask for donations and all those donations go to some cause. And that year right. was the year of the earthquake um, in Oaxaca. Right, right. And we ended up raising somewhere between 10, 15,000 bucks to send cool. down there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's fun. So you're in upstate New York. Uh, the affirmations are happening. You're, yeah, exactly. You know, so, like, so, yeah, so when my, you, my parents are, you know, at this point, they're totally like dirt poor hippies. That, uh-huh. And my dad is practicing, literally, he has got like a, an 82 like Renault, like a, a super, you know, like with, with, with like rot, like, uh, you know, in, in, on the East coast in the winter times, you know, the, the yeah, rust, the floor, the car, the floor rusts the, out. The floor rusts out, you, see, you see, the, see the pavement. That's yeah. right. And, <laughs> and literally he's got little sticky notes all the house called, that say magnificent millionaire Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and this is literally what he's, he's, he's programming himself. Uh-huh. Magnificent, I, I, and, and being, how, do, how would a millionaire be? And he's being, uh, you know, millionaire Matthew, magnificent millionaire Matthew. Uh-huh. Um, 
which you know also had a lot to do with you know like when being generous you know we demonstrate you know when we're giving we become you know open receptacles to receive you know in in this in this idea of you know just always looking at how we can be generous and you know when we when, you know we can't outgive the universe so if we're just if we're if we're putting our bet on generosity then you know we have this and 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 we're willing to stay open you know the the philosophy or the idea is that that generosity um, because if there's oneness then where we're giving will ultimately come mm -hmm. back to us as well well the beautiful thing is that all of that became manifest it all became true like i would I would think like if you're in that moment and you're in the Renault and you're like seeing the reality of the current situation, you're like, this guy is insane, <laughs> totally. right? Like, but like, look what has blossomed out of this. Like all of that became true. Um, and more significantly, you know, the cultural impact that you and your, your family, your siblings have had on the world is really remarkable. So those principles are truisms, but they're on their own timeline. Yes. Right. Totally. <laughs> so, so how do you end up making your way out to California? Then, do you, does the family relocate? So, yeah. So, uh, I moved before. I, at eighteen, I got in my little Toyota stick shift Toyota Corolla with one of my best friends. We moved to the West Coast. Uh, again, I was seeking uh -huh. snowboarding right. and trying to become a pro snowboarder. Lived a couple years in Lake Tahoe, then did three years in LA, LA in the yeah. commercial recording studio business. That all fell apart. Then, kind of little a year of transition with Folly of Heart, uh, you know, getting back into food and healthy food. Um, actually, I forgot to say when I was working in Lake Tahoe trying to be a permanent pro snowboarder, I became uh, the assistant kitchen manager of the Sugar Bowl Lodge ski mm. resort. So I was always savvy with food. I was always, and that was actually because my parents, because they were building a business, they were leaving us home alone a lot as kids. And you know, we had things like umeboshi plums and hajiki seaweed and tofu con. And you know, so I just, you know, I, I got, you know, basically got creative with ingredients and became very self-sufficient yeah. as far as producing food. And I've always had a knack for, you know, putting ingredients together. Um, and yeah, so, so recording studio, follow your heart. And then, um, and then I was kind of had another moment of losing my way. Um, and basically humbled myself. Um, I was, I was, I started taking acting classes in LA. I had like that uh -huh. LA crisis where I like started <laughs> to try. Maybe, Might as well. So, yeah, let me find my, <laughs> let me see if I can find my yeah. self importance by being an actor. Uh -huh. um, so I, I, I did that and started taking. Uh, How did you know, that go? Did you get any gigs? <laughs> no. No. Uh, no. No. I just mostly got about a year into classes um, in a small, you know, box theater next to, um, the uh, Guitar Center on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. Oh man! Okay. <laughs> uh, so right. so so then I kind of humbled myself and just you know literally called my dad in kind of tears like I don't know what I'm doing I'm kind of lost um, I'd love to come back I knew that they were starting to develop Cafe Gratitude mm -hmm. and I I called him up and asked him uh, you know I'd love to come back and learn the business oh that was the other thing I had a very um, serious relationship here uh, with a woman. And so I was like, can I come back and learn the business in a year or two and come back and open Cafe Gratitude in LA? And they said, you know, you know, of course right. the father wanting to He's been to waiting come. for that phone totally. call, right? But he knew <laughs> you had to go on this like epic hero's journey <laughs> totally. you know, in order to come back to the fold. That's right, right? that's right. What so at what point did the first Cafe Gratitude in San Francisco open? That was the first one, right? First one yeah. um, was 20th and Harrison in the Mission District. Yeah. I'm sure you went. Uh -huh. um, and it was, you know, like 1,400 square feet, hand painted signs over the door. It said, a world of plenty. Home of the abounding river board game, because you know yeah. that's the, the, the most people don't know is that Cafe Gratitude and all the the kind of eccentricities of the affirmations on the menu and the question of the day and the kind of jubilant, uh, joyful energy and attitude all comes from a board game that Matthew and Teresi created. They spent a year creating this very in depth, um, kind of transformational, spiritual. Uh, board game similar to Monopoly or Life, but instead of buying and selling, you know, hotels and charging people to stay in them, you ask people about where are you feeling unworthy, and having each yeah. player share 
where they're feeling unworthy and then say three things that you love about yourself to the person to your left. And the original Cafe Gratitude, we, it's, it was a transformational gaming parlor where we wow, served raw vegan food. Uh -huh. So literally it was, you know, it said on the, above the front door, home of the Abounding River board game and every table in the restaurant, there was no individual two top tables. Everything was a community table. Yeah, that, yeah, that I knew. And, yeah. and every table had embedded and lacquered in was this game and there was cards and basically the server didn't just, just take your order. They also encouraged you to play the game and teach you how to play the game. Oh. I actually had a position for a while in the company called the Game Meister, where I was just there <laughs> facilitating. So the whole restaurant was really this this play to just get people in and under the rubric of serving them food, but totally. just to get them to engage with this game and go on this kind of like philosophical existential inquiry. Totally. <laughs> I mean, that was literally yeah. it. That, uh -huh. that 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 literally was. You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, the gratitude piece, the food was literally the carrot to get people in the door. Right. Um, so amazing. that we could ask them the question, what are you grateful for? So we could play a, uh, uh, an invitational role in shifting awareness to gratitude. What year did it open? This was 2000, uh, 2003. <clears throat> I so just 2004, remember, 2004, right. 2004, March of 2004. I had... Uh, I was living in San Francisco up until 90, when did I move down here? 96, nine, yeah, like like almost 1997. Um, and then after living here for a couple of years, I started to hear rumors about this place, Cafe Gratitude. And it almost sounded apocryphal, like there's this place and you go. <laughs> and then you had the, um, the, the bowl, was it the, the community bowl? The Grateful the, the Bowl. The Grateful Bowl, where you could just pay whatever you felt like paying. That's and right. quite often you were just giving it away. And I was like, what is going on here? You know, And uh, it, there was almost this myth about this utopian food place <laughs> that was yeah. reaching far and wide. Yeah, that, the, the Grateful Bowl uh, came in 2007 or eight when the economy took a collapse and it was Christmas morning and me and my dad were sitting um, on Bila Farm and kind of you know, inquiring into how can we demonstrate our, um, our doubling down on generosity at a moment when everyone's feeling um, contracted yeah. and how can we step into uh, having organic food not just be for the affluent and you know thinking about like you know the the blue plate special what could we do and we realized out of all the affirmations on the menu there was no i am grateful mm -hmm. and we were like oh perfect we're going to create the grateful bowl and it will be a sliding scale and we'll serve um you know we'll, we'll communicate look some who pay, some can pay more, some can pay less, and we'll experiment with can the community take care of each other through you know those that have more will pay more and those that have less will pay less and it will balance out to where at least it covers the food cost. Is that how it played out? Um, well, we did it, we've done it, we continue to do it to this day. The mm -hmm. Grateful Bowl is still available. It's now a subsidized price of seven bucks uh, to go. Um, so you can go in and get one to go at seven bucks. You know, the, the challenge then became you had a lot of people coming in, you know, parties of four, getting a 50 cent Grateful Bowl, and then servers were, you know, depending on their income. So, you know, the ripple effect yeah. became challenged to do it um, as, you know, part of a full service, full service experience. Um, but we've to date served over 800,000 bowls uh, at under five bucks. Wow. Um, and I had the most moving, uh, meaningful moment where I was at this seminar in Culver City and this gentleman came up to me and he had heard that I was from Cafe Gratitude and he said, I just want to thank you because I lived in Oakland, uh, grew raising three kids uh, at a time in my life when I had you know, no money and you know, I know how important nutrition is in the formative years of you know, raising children and essentially we had fast food liquor stores and Cafe Gratitude's Grateful Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I was able to raise my children on you know, Grateful Bowls and we'd go there a couple times a week. And um, that's what know, it's about. Man. He was moved and I was moved. Yeah. Um, and so, 
you know, at the end of the day, did it work out exactly the way that we wanted? No, not, you know, did we ended up closing, you know, we had, yeah. a, we had a restaurant in uh, the Oakland cafe or the Oakland Whole Foods, a small little kiosk cafe gratitude. Um, and we called it cafe grateful bowl. Cause that was pretty much yeah. what everyone that got. Um, and we, you know, and we, we, we did it for probably five years. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately that unit per se, or that restaurant didn't, um, you know, lead, uh, you know, wasn't successful, but ultimately, you know, all the alchemy of, of that generosity and the forward movement and development of the company leads us to where we are today. So I, yeah. I feel- And I feel, today you've got what, six or seven? Of the, how many, how many uh, places do you seven have? Seven restaurants seven. in Southern California. Uh-huh. Um, and then we have one uh, kind of hippie handshake anomaly restaurant in Kansas City. There's a Cafe Gratitude in, in, yeah. in Kansas City um, that's kind of more like the original Cafe Gratitudes as far as in mm-hmm. design, aesthetic, and menu. So uh, it's the Santa Cruz one, right? Exactly, and yeah. then my brother, and that's actually called Grateful for Santa Cruz, so it's no longer a Cafe Gratitude, oh, wow. but it's That's still, gotta be recent. I was there maybe two years ago or something yeah, like that, exactly. and it was called Cafe Gratitude. Yeah, it, it was just in the last eight months, oh, it's, okay. or maybe a year, it's been called Grateful for Santa Cruz, but they still uh-huh. have this, a lot of the same things. Yeah, yeah. Still, you still kind of feel like you're in a Cafe Gratitude there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and for those people that are listening that have never had the experience of going to a Cafe Gratitude, um, you may not play a board game when you, <laughs> when, you, when you eat there, but you will be greeted by your, uh, your waitstaff person who will say, would you like to hear the question of the day? That question will be presented. And then every item on the menu is- And that, and that question is, is usually some version of what well, are you grateful it, for? Right. What are you passionate about? Mm-hmm. What moves you from your head to your heart? Yes. Uh, s- something that drops us into a m- likely a more meaningful conversation. If, we, if we're willing to be, um, if we're willing to go there, um, it oftentimes can stimulate some you know, potent and powerful conversation. Right. And then every item on the menu is an affirmation. I am fill in the blank. Yeah, so if you want a mint chocolate chip shake, which has been around for, since day one, it's our number one seller, you say, I am cool. And then when the server brings it out to you, they say, you, you are, are cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, or you are passionate, or you are loved, or you are kind. Um, or you are grateful. Or you are grateful. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, we, we, the way we see that is, we see it as is, is playful. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, but we do see the positive impact of creating a space that uses language intentionally to, um, to uplift people and to remind people of their greatness. You know? Well, it's, it's sort of a small thing, but it's also quite profound. Like what I see in that is, listen, when you sit down to have a meal, with another human being or even with yourself, like this is a sacred act that dates back to the beginning of humankind, obviously, or all animal kind, and we should treat it as such. So let's establish a paradigm that can be conducive to a meaningful exchange between people. And when you set it up like I am this, or here's the question of the day, you're basically saying, here's what I, here's perhaps, a subject matter that you can explore over the next hour or two, rather than like the you know the surface level nonsense that we tend to talk about. Totally, I think there was a um, what are those the, the kids in the hall? What was that? Brit- there was a British. There was like a kids. In the, I think that was Canadian, wasn't uh, it? Uh, maybe. maybe yeah. And there was this like kind of a classic comedy thing where it was like this spoof on formal fine dining and they basically you know describe what you're eating tonight and what you'll be talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was like our, our, uh-huh. you know one way to see it is like we, we're playfully inviting people to uh, enjoy and be nourished by healthy organic plant-based food and potentially have a conversation about gratitude. Right. So talk to me about the sacred commerce aspect of all this. Beautiful, yeah. So, again, um, we've we've somewhat communicated that you know as w- the way that customers come in and have this experience with uh, the restaurant. But my parents definitely were, you know, they're 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 revolutionaries. They're, they they're forward thinking, you know, beyond um, the mundane. And I, I I just you know so admire and um, honor their efforts and their intention and their commitment and conviction. 
But yeah, they, they didn't only just, they've written a book and they've led many, many workshops on uh, the principles of sacred commerce, which is uh, the principles or the basic messages, how can you run a business and also awaken the presence of love? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very, very difficult razor's edge to walk on. Um, and It's sort of like an advanced degree in conscious capitalism. It's like taking conscious capitalism an, an additional step. That's right, and it's exactly that because conscious capitalism is the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. We said um, sacred commerce is, you, get a, you have to get a pass. So it's a acronym P-A-S-S, -S, profitability, awakening, sustainability, and social justice mm. or service. So, um, you know, profitability, we see that, again, we're not a nonprofit, we're a for-profit, profitable businesses. If we want, you know, capitalism to get excited about this, it's gotta be profitable. Um, and profitability is like the health or the immune system of a organization. Cause you know, life is gonna have ups and downs, peaks and valleys. And if we haven't had, you know, a profitable business, we're gonna have a rainy day and it's gonna collapse the whole. Yeah, you know, well you can't achieve any of your other goals. Yeah, if you you're can't not profitable. Grow, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um, so essential, uh, awakening is, you know, the aspect of, you know, we are committed to the employee or what we call advocate experience working in our restaurants that you are learning new language, that there's, um, you know, communication style, there's the way that we are managing and the way that we're coaching and the way that we're, um, guiding our advocates or employees is a way that, has them be empowered. Um, for instance, we have 10 tools for creating a grateful community, which are part of the sacred commerce toolkit. And those tools are tools like acknowledgement. Mm. And that uh, acknowledgement is not just about seeing someone doing a good job and then saying, you cleaned your room, good job. It's about seeing the, um, the unexpressed qualities of curiosity, of courage, of um, uh, of of um, of wisdom, of kindness, and actually saying, "All right, we want to we want to cultivate and grow the those virtuous qualities in human beings." And so we're going to we're going to acknowledge have have the, be a culture of acknowledgement where we're just always looking for how can we see someone see their greatness, see their potential, and call that forth in our acknowledgement. So the way that that shows up is we have a process that we've been doing since day one called clearing, uh, which is essentially uh, two questions. It sounds like Scientology is not. Right, yeah, uh, I was like, everyone's people are like, gonna, start alert, getting, <laughs> people gonna start getting freaked out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but essentially it's just two questions, uh, uh -huh. one question, um, and over the years the clearing process had, has, has had many iterations. Uh, but in its most pure form, it was two questions. Uh, first question could be, um, you know, what are you um, struggling with? Um, or where are you experiencing um, self-doubt? Or, and again, this goes back to the game. And essentially it's allowing a person to just share, you know, what is distracting them from their, the present moment. Mm. Because we know that the best service and the best, um, you know, if we're if we're talking about you know customer experience and customer service, uh, we want our people to be present. And if they're if we're distracted by some story of self doubts, you know, some frustration, some irritation, and we can actually have a five minute process before their shift, such that they can shift their attention to uh, some aspect of uh, something that they do have an abundance of, something that they do can they are grateful for and then end that process with an acknowledgement, um, then you know, that ultimately is lifting them up, breathing some you know, um, life into their wings, and then hopefully that, that kindness, that presence, that listening. Um, you know, we, we oftentimes are so starved for someone to really give us like, our, their full listening. Mm -hmm. And so just a, a, a couple minutes of having someone be heard, not trying to fix or change them, but just reflecting back what we heard them say. Um, and then saying the second question, which would be, uh, what are you grateful for? And, you know, we'll just ask you, uh, Rich, what are you grateful for today? 
I'm grateful to be having this experience with you right now. Amazing. Well, I just would love to <laughs> acknowledge you for uh, the quality of your listening and the quality of your presence. It really, it's an easy space to share into. So thank you. I appreciate that, Ryland. You're making my job very easy right now. <laughs> um, You're doing my job for me. But is this is this something? That, so this is something you do for all of the staff. Um, we have an aspiration to have every staff member. Um, have a, a clearing process before they start. Um, you know, it's. I, I'm just imagining the person who's like, "Look, man, I just needed a, like a dishwasher job. Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not signing up for all this." Yeah, you know, woo-woo crazy shit. Totally, people, yeah. lot, lots of resistance, and ultimately, um, you know, what the clearing has kind of evolved into is, you know, because we ask the question of the day, which is always the second question of the clearing, is the question that then we extend to our guests. So that question becomes asked around the house. And then, um, you know, on a good day, people, you know, Rich, you know, what are you grateful for? Awesome. I want to acknowledge you uh -huh. for, you know, being an amazing team member today. Thank yeah. you for coming in. Let's have a great shift. Yeah. Um, so it, it used to be like five minutes per person, like right. sit down. Um, and, you know, over the years, that's evolved to what we call clearing on the court is asking each other the question of the day and then acknowledging each other for something that we appreciate about one another. And ultimately that creating a space for, um, or that, that creating a, um, a quality of uh, human experience that creates what people have called the vibe at Cafe Gratitude. The, uh -huh. you know, there's a vibe and that is, you know. Yeah, there definitely is. You go in there, you feel good. Everybody who's working there, looks you in the eye, like they seem present, they are listening, like it is different from your typical restaurant experience. Totally, and you know, we've, we've put a lot of energy and a lot of money and time yeah. and effort. And you know, the other things like, you know, we have all advocate meetings, which are just meetings where we put everybody in a room together. We have translators for the back of the house, Spanish speaking folks. And essentially it's just some, um, nugget of inspiration, wisdom, um, life knowledge, you know, some of the stuff that you teach here or you share with your guests on the show, we'll have that be, you know, presented or communicated. Like I've had Marianne Williamson come in and talk to our right. staff right. Um, before. <laughs> uh, and um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, again, and then another thing, one of the benefits that we've offered people, again, in the, the aspect of, you know, awakening or transformation, we've paid for people to do the Landmark Forum, right. um, which is a transformational weekend course that many people have heard of, many people probably haven't heard of, but it's essentially a three-day uh, personal growth, self-empowerment course that happens all over the world. And not that we have any official tie with them, it's just a course that we've seen in three short days, excuse me, three short days um, provides you know tremendous transformation yeah. value. My, my parents did it many years ago, but it was very impactful in a positive way for them. I've never been myself. I know tons of people that have done it and have benefited tremendously from that experience. Um, but it, but there's an aspect of that that got you guys in like a little bit of a sticky wicket back in the day with the San Francisco restaurant, right? Are you okay totally, talking about totally. that? I like, mean, no, Cafe, gra always, Cafe Gratitude. I've read about this and I'm like, I don't, I'm confused. Like, I don't, under, I don't understand why it's such a big, like Landmark Forum is pretty mainstream. Yeah, right? like you know, talk like, about not super fringe. I mean, yeah. we as a company have done a lot more fringe things than yeah. you know, encouraging Landmark education. Um, but yeah, Cafe, Gra Cafe Gratitude has definitely been a, um, you know, we, we've been a, kind of a hotbed for, you know, suspicion of cultum. Right. Um, and like, what is this sacred commerce thing? That's and right. This game and like, what's the, what is the agenda here? Totally. We're trying like, to brainwash there, there, there people. Was, into... There, there was a, 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 some, some rumor that you had to get to work at Cafe Gratitude, you had to get a B Love tattoo. Right. So for uh, those that are just listening, you rolled up your sleeves and you have B on your left forearm and love on your right forearm. And yeah. me and my dad went and got those together. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> True story. Of course you did, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right after we went uh -huh. and did a, a, a men's new warrior training weekend <laughs> uh, where, where I, I was like, all right, you know, it was kind of like, how are you going to be, how are you going to demonstrate masculinity in the world? And the thing that came to me was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to be love and I'm going to have loving be a masculine thing that 
I actually love is sourced from within me and I it can't never be taken away from me. And that 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 actually is right. a, a beautiful masculine quality. How that, dare you? <laughs> yeah. So um, so yeah. So the, I mean, yes, cafe gratitude um, over the years um, because we we you know we were we were super. I mean, there was a moment when you know I, I, I kind of feel like this is almost like talking back in the day, like in the '60s and '70s. There was like a, a moment when cafe gratitude was. You know, when business went down and we would have all employee meetings and we'd do ah meditations mm. for abundance for for <laughs> the restaurant and for yeah. all of our lives. Like we'd get all of our uh-huh. employees together and you know, do a meditation for the abundance of the restaurant. And you know, looking in the window, that could be <laughs> Yeah, you're like, kooky. what is going on there? But I mean, you're in the mission in San Francisco. It's like, you know. Totally. And you know, other things we used to we used to take a, 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 a fork to a wine glass in the middle of the dining room and have people read the mission statement out loud or we'd have uh-huh. the, um, or we'd, we'd, we'd do a minute of laughter because right. one, one of the turns You're creating in the game. a hostile work environment, <laughs> Ryland. I'm like, totally. I mean, you gonna make me laugh? <laughs> I do not want to laugh for a minute. This is absurd. You know, uh-huh. but that is, that is how we are as human beings, as adults. No, I did, I, I'm not, that is so, mm. no. Um, mm. So we, you know, and even in Venice, I actually tried to, I, I actually one night took the whole dining room and got everybody to do a laughing yoga exercise where everyone laughed out loud for a minute. Uh-huh. And some people were laughing at us laughing, but that was fine too. Right. Um, so, so, all right, so walk me through the landmark thing and the San Francisco restaurant and like kind of what happened from your perspective. Yeah, from what happened, we, you know, we got, we were super eager beaver and like landmark, you know, my dad met his wife at, at, Ter, at Tercy's, mm. um, who was also the co-founder of Cafe Gratitude. They met at Landmark. My dad was potentially going to become a Landmark forum leader. Tercy was leading programs at Landmark. You know, part of the inspiration of Cafe Gratitude and the abandoned of board game was Came inspired that from that experience. Uh, you know, we had had such profound experiences of transformation um, from this work. And again, I did it when I was 18 or not, I did it 19, 19, right around that same time, that transformational point in my life in this, in the second world trade tower, the 14th floor. And my dad actually resisted doing it for another 10 years. And then he finally did it when my mom left him, Mm -hmm. um, for another woman and his life fell apart. And he, that's actually where he went to kind of put himself back together. Mm -hmm. That's where he met Teresi's Um, and then kind of they gave birth to Cafe Gratitude out of that experience. And again, we had just seen so many people in our lives, anyone that had become friends, you know, good friends with us, we were always encouraging it. And we were seeing people, you know, having total estranged, 10, 15 year estranged relationships with family members, totally getting things complete, you know, Mm. Um, you know, uh, apologizing, and getting resolution around abuse and addiction and uh, yeah, part of the fundamental paradigm is getting people to confront their truth to you know kind of pull down the shades of denial and then forcing them to have those uncomfortable conversations with themselves and with the other people uh, in which with whom they're in conflict or have some kind of unresolved trauma in order to create that healing so that you can become a more whole human being and fully integrated. And I think the thing that's so profound about it and the thing that's why I still recommend it is there's, we all know that we wanna be more authentic, but we also know that we're completely full of it. (laughs) I mean, we're so full of it. And it's just safe and easy to stay in that place. Totally, and there's, you just can't quite, you know it, you wanna be authentic, you know that everything is good, but yet it's still safer, comfortable and, it, there's more mental justification for things. And going through that program, I, you know, time and time again, I see people basically putting themselves up on the cross and acknowledging how full of it, how phony, how much, how arrogant, you know, and, and, and really owning things that three days before you couldn't have imagined they would be able to claim, acknowledge, right. and like point the things that were so obvious to the room, you know, watching them up there and then them just, 
really acknowledging that and then having that conversation with people in their lives who have become completely estranged from them because they were so in their righteousness about their perspective. Yeah. So I still remember my dad calling me from a payphone like in the hallway outside of the you know wherever this was taking place. Yeah. And having this incredibly profound conversation with him. I mean, this was a really long time ago, but I still remember it because it really was transformational in our relationship. Mm. So, but anyway, I think there's so, a thing like, as I understand it, the, the 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 issue came about because it wasn't like, hey, we suggest you go do no, this. No, no. It was like we, you have to do this. Totally, right? and that's we, a, there's a difference. Totally, there. we we. Um, we got, as I said, we were kind of eager beager and kind of staunch about it. And we had people who were managers. We weren't making employees or advocates do it. We were encouraging, but we were we were we were making it mandatory for managers to yeah. go do it, seeing that it was like a you know communication training. Um, and people were in resistance to that, and so yeah, that that is like a bridge too far. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I get it. I I. I Hoa poa pono. If I, you know, if if, <laughs> if I if I went too far yeah. with it, again, it was it was well intended, and I get that um, sometimes over excitement can be not as perceptive to nuance and mm. um, to where people are. How come you guys haven't re reopened a cafe gratitude in San Francisco? Um, well, we've been busy. You know, seven, eight years we've been down here. Opened eight, seven restaurants, um, and we still have Gracias Madre there. Right. Um, still doing well. And really doing business in California is challenging. Um, just the, the amount of legalities and, um, you know, again, it's like, it sounds terrible. Like, you know, you want workers' rights, you want benefits for employees, you, but it's also very, you know, instance like if you're text messaging with a staff member, you then have to pay for that cell phone. Or um, if you're cutting someone's shifts, you know you have to give them two weeks' notice before changing shifts. Where you know restaurants Those is things, like yeah, that's happening moment to moment. Yeah, so I mean, it's yeah, just, California makes it hard for small business owners. Yeah, so uh, and San Francisco is even you know uh, even again better for the worker. Which again, uh, you know we we did eight years there and you know we had provided 100% health care for all of our employees even in Marin County or in different places because we knew it was the right thing to do but ultimately um, you know there was aspects of um, overextending ourselves and you know we, we oftentimes said in the first round of Ch Cafe Gratitude we were really focused on the ASS and we forgot about the P, the P. part yeah. <laughs> and we made an ass out of ourselves <laughs> because, you know, we, you know, ultimately we were- Pass without P is just an ass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we have considered um, going back, but we just haven't, haven't, yeah. haven't gotten to it yet. East Coast too, man. East Coast, New, New York, York City, DC, Miami. Boston. Yeah. yeah, you gotta- you Gotta got to step out. I know, yeah. it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. time. Um, Cool, well, I love, I wanna shift gears in a minute, but I yep. do wanna acknowledge, um, in addition to Cafe Gratitude, you have Gracias Madre, originally in San Francisco, you have one in West Hollywood here, and that place is just insane. It's so freaking good. And one of the many amazing things about it is nowhere will you see any mention of the fact that it is even a plant-based restaurant, a vegan restaurant. It's just a beautifully appointed, um, place, like the architecture, the vibe, like everything about it is incredibly inviting. When you go in, you're like, oh man, this place is cool. The food is amazing and that's it. And the place is packed. And I would imagine 95, 98% of the people in there are not on a plant-based lifestyle trip. They're just looking for good food at a cool place. Totally, yeah. I mean, that, that really has been, I mean, I'd say that that's been Cafe Gratitude and Gracias Madre's role coming to LA was really how do we take something that's very fringe, very, um, you know, either you're into it or you're not, and making it really opening the door on plant based cuisine to everyone as a, you know, as a, not a dogma, but kind of a genre. 
mm-hmm. and really like, yeah, I, I, I go and have Italian on Monday nights and I go, or no, let's say Mondays, we'll go meatless on Mondays. We'll go, you know, let's go gratitude or gracias on Mondays and we'll go Thai or go, you know, Indian or whatever on the other nights of the week. But it's not like I'm only a plant-based person. So I only go to Cafe Gratitude. I'd say even at Cafe Gratitude, it's maybe right. 80% of our guests are just people who know they should be eating more plants, more organic food, more healthy, made from scratch, um, high quality food. And so they just build it in as a right. part of their life versus you know something that's a superlative, you, you're either in or you're out. But at Gracias Madre, I mean, when you're at Gratitude, you're getting the bowls. Like you, you do have the sense like, oh, this is super healthy plant food. Totally. But Gracias Madre, I think there's yeah. probably a lot of people don't that even, eat there and leave and don't even realize that there was no meat or dairy in anything that they were eating. Like it's, cause it's just not, it's delicious regardless. Totally, I mean, I think that's that's reflected in, in feedback like, oh, I went to, oh, your restaurant's across these miles. I had the, I think these uh, I had chicken. had the carnitas. Yeah, I had the chicken, <laughs> I had the chicken uh, totopo, or I had the chicken uh, flautos, you know, mm. it's like, you know, it's yeah, butternut squash. I don't think you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yes, absolutely, uh, I'd, I'd say that that restaurant even more so um, really just is a bridge for everyone to have an, a really great experience. You know, you have a margarita and you have chips and guac and then by the time the food comes, you know, you're just in the experience in and there's no like, I didn't get anything. There's, right. no, there's no missing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think one of the, one of the, not issues, but one of the things that you see when you go to plant-based restaurants is like I eat a ton of food, man. Like I, I need a lot of food. So I need big portions. I, I wanna feel like full when I'm leaving. And yeah. you know, I get that across Gracias Madre. Like at some places I kind of have to eat before I go and then I have to eat on my way home. You know, it's uh-huh. like, you know? Uh, and I'll eat beautiful food at the restaurant, but you know, it's it's just not sating me in, in, in the way that I think um, a restaurant needs to if it's trying to appeal to a broader cross section of the population. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's our most, by far, our most successful restaurant. Right. You got to do more of those, man. Speaking, yeah, newsflash uh, we're actually closing the Newport Beach Gratitude. Oh, you are. Uh, and reopening in October. So we're closing September 3rd and reopening in October or November, uh, the second Southern California Gracias Madre. Oh, cool, in the uh, same location? In the same different? exact location, oh, right. we're just wow. doing a refresh, mm. redesign, um, and reopening. We think it's gonna be a more appropriate fit for the Newport Beach, Orange County crowd. I mean, our most popular things there are margaritas and nachos. Uh-huh. And so <laughs> clearly yeah. that, that they're, they're telling us yeah. what they want. And so, um, yeah, that's actually some, Big news, um, company wide, that we're yeah. very excited. And about. you're you're working on the Agora Hills Cafe Gratitude too. Is that not public? No, that's actually Sage. That's my sister. Oh, Sage. Okay, that was the one. I yeah. Right. My sister is yeah Sage Vegan Bistro, which she has three uh, organic plant based restaurants in mm-hmm. LA, and uh, you know people have referred to us as the vegan mafia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but the yeah, so she's opening her fourth in. Um, in Granada, or no, in uh, Agora Hills. Agora, yep. yeah, right down the street from yeah, here. Yeah, I'm, I'm investing, I invited yeah. you to invest. Yeah, I know, I know, I'm thinking about <laughs> okay, it. Okay, good. I'm thinking about it. Um, exciting, man. Well, I wanna, uh, I wanna switch gears. Uh, oh, actually just, oh, yeah, just to, cause I, I wanted to complete the thought, which was basically sacred commerce is the past. Oh yeah, we didn't, yeah, So profitability, really awakening, we got way down the awakening mm-hmm. tunnel and went into cults and stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then sustainability. So really, we're an organic, 100% organic, plant-based uh, restaurant that serves. You know, most of everything we do is from scratch. Um, we've put a ton of time and energy into sourcing the best ingredients. Where many restaurants have two or three vendors, we have 40, 50. Uh, I think that the most we had 70 vendors. Um, you know, getting you know one or two ingredients from a different vendor. Um, because we had an emotional attachment or an ethical attachment to where something was coming from. So, um, you know, and that's been, you know, what we've been, 
you know, doing since day mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were some of the first people to do cold press juice on the West Coast um, right. when cold press juice wasn't even in the lexicon of understanding. Uh, you know, cold processed coffee. We uh, we actually sold a blue bottle coffee, their first espresso machine that was from our. We took it out of our place because we were going to only do cold processed coffee, mm. uh, and sold it to the blue oh, bottle wow. for their first espresso machine um, in San Francisco back in the day. Um, and so we, you know, we've just we've always had a commitment to food as medicine. No amount of pesticide, herbicide, fungicide should be in our food, and just have gone to great lengths to, um, you know, protect. Um, you know, the ingredients that we're putting in the food and, um, and, and, you know, it's down to the salt, it's down to the cumin, it's down to every legume, every nut seed, um, and really putting energy into finding where those, where those foods can come from. I would imagine along the way, people would have said to you, listen, man, like, you know, you're going to have to compromise here and there because, you know, you're never going to be able to scale what you're doing or reach your profitability goals. Uh, when you have so many vendors and you're so choosy and picky about where this stuff is coming from, like no one's going to know the difference. Like, come on. Yeah, and to be honest, I think you know we have had, you know, we have had to make compromises. Not to say we haven't made any compromises, mm-hmm. but those compromises don't include us going outside of you know bringing in you know organic. Um, Produce organic ingredients. Um, you know, I think there's a few items like there's a, a beer um, at one of the on tap that's not a certified organic product, and um, you know we do work with some uh, small organic farmers who are not certified, but we've you know understand their practice, understand mm-hmm. what they're doing, and you know we are happy to serve and, and sell their produce. Um, so when you're trying to vet these farmers or these sources, do you go to the farms? Are you trying to make them as local as possible? Like what is the the process or the yeah. criteria? Um, yeah, over the years it's been you know different things, but definitely visiting, having our chef visit farms. I've gone and visited farms. Um, you know, working with um, distributors who are only distributing organic produce, such that we know that there's not going to be a, a bait and switch, and you know, some kind yeah. of hustle there of re-stickering things and saying this is conventional. And because there's, is there know, a lot of that going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we it, o- over the years, you know, obviously we're always trying to focus on you know California-based. Um, you know, obviously, there's some stuff that's coming from uh, from Mexico, avocados, uh, depending on the season. Um, but you know, it's mostly Southern California, some Northern California, and then you know, if there's uh, you know nuts and seeds, uh, and you know specialty products like coffee or cacao that's obviously coming from South yeah. America and other places. But again, we're working with companies who are sourcing, and they're doing, you know, we trust that they're doing their due mm-hmm. diligence on their end to know where those ingredients are coming from. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, sorry, did I no, interrupt no. you? Um, I think that's a natural segue into the the next thing that I want to talk to you about, which is regenerative agriculture and, and how you got interested in this and, and kind of where your head's at right now with it. So, you know, walk me through this. Totally. Um, yeah, the most the most exciting thing happening on planet yeah. Earth, regenerative yeah. agriculture. Uh, so we're go- we're uh, we're segueing from the David Bronner part uh, of you into the Zach Bush part of you. Totally. Yeah, okay. uh, so yeah, um, again, I, I I've been serving, selling a proponent of organic agriculture, organic food, local food, plant based food for my whole life. I'm 39 years mm-hmm. old, but professionally been selling organic food for 15 years in the restaurants. Um, and then even before that with uh, Follow Your Heart. Uh, right. And, uh, and I, I kind of thought I knew every not everything, but I thought I had a basic understanding of um, organic agriculture, environmentalism, sustainability, you know, and I, I went to New Zealand uh, back in 2013 uh, on a trip to where I was going to show a film that I had made called May I Be Frank, which was a right. transformational documentary about a guy, you know, having It's like trans- Italian American dude, Frank, who's like overweight. You bring him into the restaurant. And what's cool about that, I don't want to derail us, but yeah, yeah. derail too much. But um, what was cool about that is you would expect 
okay, you're gonna feed him this great food and he's gonna lose some weight and all of that. But really it's about his spiritual transformation, like how he has to reckon with his past. Yes. Emotionally and yes. his family. Yes. That I think is the real heart and beauty of that piece. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say that the, the aspect and the intention of sacred commerce really is that at a, at a high level and a, and a deep level of commitment, that, that spiritual transformation is the intention that we um, are committed to and have had um, a desire to fulfill in you know, small micro doses to our guests, mm -hmm. to our employees, advocates, um, and ultimately to the business world and to the world watching. Right. Um, so, um, but yeah, so may I be frank, I, we, we went, to, I went to New Zealand to show the film and do a screening and Frank went with me and went with my wife and I led a, a little workshop on sacred commerce. And then I ended up in, and just to say, I kind of went there a little bit like an arrogant Californian who thought his shit didn't stink and he knew everything about plant-based and vegan. And I know all, you know, um, you know, I have compostable this and my packaging is this. And, um, and I had a complete, state change moment where I learned new information that changed everything. And that was, I was sitting in a panel discussion, sitting in the audience, just watching a panel discussion of six expert scientists um, talking about the, 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 the title of the panel was called, Can Human Beings Sustain Themselves on Planet Earth? And basically five out of six said no, and that the dire state of things is far further than we're mostly led to believe. And that, you know, it was like people were crying in the, in the room, people mm -hmm. on stage were crying. It was like a, an emotional, um, and then the last guy spoke with this guy was by the name of, uh, his name was by uh, Graham Sate. And he is a agricultural consultant and kind of soil science, not really a scientist, but a, uh, in depth knowledge, um, study of, uh, soil science and plant life and um, uh, uh, trains agronomists and basically said they're all they're all telling the truth but there's a blind spot in the conversation and that blind spot is soil and its unique ability to sequester and hold all the excess carbon that's in the atmosphere be having us up over 410 parts mm -hmm. per million, we can actually draw that carbon down through our food choices and create a benefit of that carbon being in our soil versus a villain in our atmosphere causing global warming. And I had and and I and again I, I had knew that you know, I think we all knew that photosynthesis you know takes carbon out of the atmosphere makes oxygen for us to breathe, but the part that I don't think I didn't get was that the way that carbon is transferred from the atmosphere and has been since the beginning of time to cycle um, on planet Earth is that photosynthesis is the driver of that transference of carbon, and that trees plants grasses. Every day, every, every when the sun's out, they're pulling carbon in and they're sharing somewhere between 40 and 60% of that carbon, carbon dioxide, they're adding water, hydrogen, and turning it into a carbohydrate. And they build their selves with that carbon and then they pump 40 to 60% of that carbon into the soil and feed microorganisms. And as those microorganisms eat that carbon sugar, that becomes stable carbon in the soil. So I just you know, basically got for the first time, every living plant is on our side, helping us balance this global challenge that I haven't heard any real solutions to. There's like this kick in the can down the road to you know, technology saving us one day in the future, but really, and we have to reduce emissions, we have to, you know, um, decarbonize our, um, our energy sector, but we're also over 415 parts per million. What I don't really see, and that carbon is not going anywhere, what is the real plan for the pullback plan? Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I saw, oh my God, I could see the living skin of the earth and humans tending to that living skin of the earth 
sequestering that carbon and balancing, reversing global warming. And it was like, I just didn't get that functionality. I didn't see how that bigger cycle circle worked. And I got it for the first time. And it was like, you know, it's like a, these spiritual moments of like a thousand suns going off in my mind and my heart. And I literally was like, this is true, real, and possible. And for some reason, I have a, a, a role in being a catalyst and a missionary and a messenger for this new understanding of soil's role, regenerative agriculture's role as a pathway forward for humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this idea that the solution literally resides, but you know, underneath our feet. Yeah. It's right there. Uh, and yet humanity has just gotten in the way and interfered with this very natural process. And if there's a way for us to revert uh, or get out of the way and start practicing these things that can enhance this cycle's ability to do what it already knows how to do, we are then in the solution and not in the problem. That's right, and, and I would even say there's an, sort of a, a conservation and a sustainability mindset, which is you know, let nature do its thing without us, which I think even the next conscious shift is how do we- Accelerate. How do we, yeah, how do we participate in this catalyzing what they call a trophic cascade in an ecosystem. There's an, this beautiful video that really demonstrates regeneration, which is when human beings re-released wolves into uh, Yellowstone National Forest or park. And essentially because th there hadn't been any predators in that system, it basically, um, the deer started to just hang out in the valleys and kind of eat away the grasses and st things started to erode. But when they reintroduced the wolves, it kind of kicked the whole ecosystem into um, gear and where everybody was kind of on each other's toes and everybody was playing each other's, uh, playing a role and people weren't getting kind of lazy, fat and, fat and happy and ultimately costing you know, degradation on the overall system. Mm -hmm. And within six years after they released the wolves into Yellowstone National, it's called How Wolves Change Rivers. If you look it up on YouTube, yeah, I I've heard of this. 40 yeah, yeah. million people yeah, have watched yeah, yeah. it. But it, I mean, it's this unbelievable phenomenon of how this trophic cascade happens all through the ecosystem of, um, you know, there, there becomes more rodents, there becomes more owls, there becomes more hawks, there becomes more growth in the trees, there becomes more grasslands, there, there bec the roots strengthen and hold the river going in one direction versus um, kind of starting to erode and... Um, uh, having the, the banks kind of eroding away because the, the 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 deer had kind of had no no predators, no one moving them around their kind of mm -hmm. uh, domain, and in turn the system started to uh, what we call it, desertify, and so um, yeah, so th th this this you know shift of consciousness of kind of doing less harm to how our land management practices actually enhance ecosystem function and the carrying capacity of the land. And, um, and just really seeing for the first time, like, wow, something to proactively do that actually doesn't just sustain or slow damage down, it actually restores, regenerates mm -hmm. and renews, which in the definition of sustainability, which is kind of like our North Star around like, all right, we're destroying the planet, let's be sustainable. It's like to sustain something that's already broken is sustaining something that's broken. Right. It's broken. So or just holding on to something so that it doesn't break, right? As a pair, as opposed to being reparative. That's right. That's right? right. Yeah, I think you know, in a in a in a macro sense, we need to telescope up from our kind of view of the landscape and take a much broader view of the macro system. Like you can say, okay, I'm vegan, I'm plant-based. So, you know, I'm, I'm reducing harm by not eating animals. But if all the food that you're eating is non-organic or it's being shipped from far away locations, which obviously has a huge <laughs> environmental impact, or it's the result of monocropping, which you're not really 
in the solution in the way that you might might be deluding yourself that you are, right? Like That's that right. is not a proactive. Yeah, you're you're it's less harmful than doing other things, but it it's not as far down along the road as as I think a lot of people think it is. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and I and I was a I was kind of shouting from the rooftops right. that is was that your current your understanding before going to New Zealand? Yeah, I mean I I thought that the most sustainable and the best way to preserve the planet was an organic plant-based diet, where um, I still think that's a really righteous path um, because it's saying no to the 95% of what is a total desecration and a total destruction to so many things, including you know animal welfare, including you know the immense amount of methane that CAFO feedlot operations put off. Um, but again, it was still uh, I still didn't if I if I look in like my heart of like how are we going to get there? Like it, it just it was it was still just like a a reactive not participating versus what is the macro you know living system of Gaia, this, you know, living, breathing organism called planet Earth. And, you know, what are the bigger cycles of that? And how do we support those cycles to be most uh, abundant and most um, fertile? And I think, you know, it's, it's beautifully articulated in the distinction between, you know, a lot of organic agriculture can be seen as, a, you know, it's, it's a list it's a list of practices that you can't use. Like you can't use these chemicals, mm-hmm. you can't use uh, these fungicides, you can't use these um, synthetic, the synthetic nitrogen. Whereas something like biodynamic, which would be kind of an early um, expression and articulation of a regenerative agriculture, really saw the whole farm as a living organism and that you know, the, the pollinators, the microorganisms in the soil, the earthworms, the, uh, the owls, the, you know, the, the, the whole thing is a living system. And how do, we, uh, how do we support that living system to continue to stay um, vital? And, right. and, and, and what are the things that actually enhance soil life um, or enhance biodiversity and, um, and it versus just I don't do these things, and really that's regenerative agriculture is this kind of and again I, I you know I just want to acknowledge that you know what we dis, what I discovered and what became Kiss the Ground with you know the co-founders of Finian and Lauren um, was was knowledge that has been kept and understood from many indigenous cultures around the world um, many. Pioneering, um, you know, pioneering farmers and permaculturists, and um, you know, this is wisdom that's been in little pockets um, for a, a long time, coming from many places. You know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of that wisdom, and we saw be that, being that we live in Los Angeles, and you know, the the communications capital of the world, the trend-setting capital of the world. We said, all right. This is the most exciting, important idea, inspiration, pathway. We're going to tell the story. We want this to be a, a paradigm shift of, you know, that we can actually go beyond sustainability. We can actually regenerate and restore our soils. We can restore our biodiversity. We can, you know, have healthy food for, you know, the idea that we can't feed the world on small-ish or even medium-sized farms is absurd. You know, 40% of the food gets wasted. Um, 80% of the food feeding the total population comes from small farms. So walk me through that because that's that's the thing that I that I have difficulty wrapping my head around. I mean, the conventional wisdom is, look, uh, if CAFOs do one thing, it's that they know how to drive economies of scale. Like they take a super concentrated, you know, n- number of animals and they try to blow them up into food using the least amount of time and resources possible. And they've kind of perfected this, right? This is having a huge deleterious impact on the planet, untold suffering, all kinds of terrible issues with that. Nobody's a fan of this. 
But when I look at how many people are on the planet and the forecast for you know the 10 billion that are soon to come, and then I look at um, biodynamic farming, my first instinct is we don't have enough land. Like you're, you're, you need more space for these cattle. Like certainly we're gonna have to reduce our, our addiction to animal foods on some level. Not everyone's gonna get struck vegan, but how can we scale up this um, this wonderful practice that is yeah, I mean, you know, sequestering the, the, carbon and regenerating the, the, the earth and all of that and do it in a way that actually is gonna function in the modern world. Totally. Um, I'd say, you know, my view is that the, the big billboard is we need to eat more plants, eat less meat as like the, the big the biggest billboard that as far as where we are, because 95% of the meat that we're eating is, you know, just a total train wreck. But if we want to get interested in the more nuts and bolts of how to grow food in a way that actually restores, heals, and not just, um, you know, you know, the the aspect of animals and eating animals and animals' role on um, grasslands and keeping grasslands healthy. And ultimately, when we're talking about keeping grasslands healthy, we're talking about keeping land that we're growing grains um, for eating. Um, you know, without when we decoupled um, animals from land, we just put animals in barns and then we put chemicals to boost the nitrogen, the NPK. Um, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus as like the you know the quick fix to grow um, to grow you know grains and crops. Um, th- essentially, uh, the the chemicals obviously started to degrade the farmland. In the mm-hmm. last forty years, we've lost we've lost thirty percent of uh, the farmland being grown to desertification. Right. So, so destroyed. So the United Nations said we have 60 years left under the current system of harvest. 60 seasons left. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, you know, we have to we have to scale way back. I mean, right now most meat that we're eating is you know coming from a, a total destruction system. Right. So we need to cut way back on that. Um, we need to be eating you know more plant rich diet. And then if we're, if we're really serious about how we can actually restore and heal land and restore the, you know, the broken um, soil, um, you know, animals grazing on grasslands has an amazing restorative effect. And that is a solution for those that are gonna continue to eat meat. And that can be a, um, something that has a total full environmental win for the planet. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's showed that, you know, a CAFO situation has total methane, um, a lot of greenhouse gases going up, and a um a grazing situation where you have managed grazing of animals on grassland, you have a net sequestration of carbon going even, you know, the cows still produce methane, but within that overall system, there is a Uh, a net sequestration of carbon and a significant net sequestration of carbon going into that land that's being managed that way. So the, you know, and a lot of the land that across the country is not fit for agriculture. We don't want to be tilling it. We want want to put in annual crow crops. So there's actually, and we've killed all the natural um, bison or, you know, grazing animals oftentimes that were on that land. And so, um, you know, there's this real live opportunity of, you know, putting grazing animals back to uh, a good life and um, having a net beneficial, you know, impact on that, on that soil, on that grassland, on that environment. Um, and, you know, we're obviously, you know, encouraging, um, you know, a, a, a less meat consumption, but for the people that are, are gonna eat meat, this is an opportunity for that to have a beneficial impact. Mm-hmm. And again, I get the morality aspect of you know people not wanting to kill animals and I love and respect that um, perspective. Um, but for those that are, those that are um, choosing to eat meat, here is a, a really a win-win situation. 
um, that can have a benefit for 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 many stakeholders, yeah, including you know the thing, that, the biggest thing that we don't have a solution for, which is how are we going to sequester enough carbon such that we don't go into climate chaos? Yeah, we need some emergency actions right now. We really are running out of time, and things like the farm bill and these subsidies are are really preventing us from embracing a solution that's right in front of us, like. You know, it, it seems to me that if we could stop subsidizing the gr- you know the growing of all these crops that go to feed, and we can start emphasizing biodynamic farming, the price of meat's going to go way up, and that's going to cull the herd, literally in terms of like the number of humans that can afford these meat products. It's going to drive down meat consumption and make that possibility more realistic. But there doesn't seem to be any political will for this. That's the problem. Uh, there's, there's not, but I'll, I'll tell you, since, since we uh, started Kiss the Ground seven years ago and we launched the Soil Story, which was the first piece mm-hmm. of media that, we, that, you know, that I had seen that was like a, a three-minute short synopsis of regenerative agriculture and the potential of it, um, the amount of attention and term, you, people using the terminology and the amount of investment going into that space has been, I mean, it's still, yeah. a, it's still a drop in the bucket, but, you know, the fact that General Mills, you know, making a public declaration, people could say, oh, that's total greenwash, you know, a million acres, you know, by 2030. Um, another startup called Indigo um, just committed to, I think, um, you know, 10 million acres under regenerative management, and they're wanting to pay farmers to sequester carbon. Um, you know, it, the, the the momentum that when we first started talking about this, it was very fringe. And and again, I didn't know it. You know, people like um, you know, I, my understanding is Al Gore. People were very experts on you know climate. People, um, you know, Bill McGibbon, you know, had understanding of this, but they weren't mm-hmm. standing like this was a solution. It was still too fringe. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. But now there's an article every week that's ca- ca- coming out talking about how farmers can be a solution yeah. to climate change. Yeah. Um, so, and the great thing about it is that it embraces the farming community. I think one of the problems with the, uh, you know, this movement in some regards is that it embitters the farming community because they feel like they've been positioned as the enemy, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas this is saying, let's embrace our farmers and help them create a better, more profitable life for themselves with greater yields. Like the big lie in all of this is that we've had to make this transition into factory farming because that's the only way to get the yields. And and as all of your work shows in the documentaries and the advocacy and all of that, it's just not true. Like when they make this switch to a, a you know a biodynamic approach, the we're, we're calling up, we're calling it regenerative yeah, regenerative right, okay. agriculture. Regenerative but bio, you know, is, a, is right. a, another form of regenerative mm-hmm. agriculture. Um, so yeah, so, you know, the, the things I'd love to share, um, you know, cause the kind of the work that we've been doing over, you know, seven years there, as you said, it's, you know, it's been a lot of, we've kind of been looking at, you know, how do we, how do we shift critical mass to understand this such that actions, you know, people start adopting actions, business start taking this on. This becomes, you know, the way that we're growing food, fiber, and fuel is, through a regenerative perspective and how can we have our ecosystems being restored while we're producing the goods um, that we need for, for humanity. Um, and you know, the, the, the good news is, is that farmers can make a lot more money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're not talking about, you know, it's not a get rich, <laughs> you know, by no means, but there's a lot of evidence and a lot of examples of where farmers have gone down this path and made the successful transition. And, you know, they're not going from it from an altruism or like save the planet or even if they even believe in climate change. Um, but they're going from a place of I'm watching my family farm, you know, degrade. I'm watching people get sick. Uh, I'm watching... Um, uh, I'm watching. I need to get more equipment, bigger pieces of land. You know, I think um, you know a fact that the same amount of nitrogen fertilizer to grow one bushel of wheat in 1970 has now tripled. So you have to use three times the amount of nitrogen to get the same bushel of corn. Um, 
in, in wow. present day. Um, so, you know, number one, the number one profession that has suicide, high suicide rates is farmers. And essentially the opportunity here is that in the next, because the average age of the farmer, especially in this country, is between you know, 60, 65, 68 years old, in the next 10 years, there's gonna be you know, one of the biggest land transfers you know, since mm-hmm. we can remember. And if in that transition, we have the precedent of regenerative agriculture is the way, um, and people in the way that young people are excited to get into business and entrepreneurship and businesses that have a purpose, which is, you know, a lot of young people don't want to just be part of the right. status quo business corporation, blah, blah, blah. They want to be just like kids don't want to be a part of the farming system, which is just chemicals, corn, mm-hmm. soy, and sending it to, you know, China or ethanol or, you know, to make ethanol or whatever. There's an opportunity to have the farmer be the hero that we can actually yeah. restore our landscapes and restore our food system, restore our climate, and uh, and and farmers can make, make a little more more coin on it. Yeah, it's cool, and you're seeing that. I mean, you are seeing lots of young people who are excited about this. Like when I was in college, like no one was interested in this, and now all these young people getting graduate degrees and in, in, in this field, and you know, going to work on these farms, it's it's pretty cool. Like it is happening. It's 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 happening. Yeah. You know, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, some of the two programs that we've really landed on um, that we're really thrilled about is the first is we have an advocacy training program because we saw, wow, I learned some new information and I became a catalyst for so much. So how do we grow this army of um, you know, messengers? Because right now the environmentalist, it's, there's not really a, an exciting path, there's not a pathway for an environmentalist to feel lit up. You're mm-hmm. still just kind of fighting against and a, a system that's beyond winning. Whereas the context of regeneration, the North Star of regeneration is like you can actually see the active participation. You can see the way forward from it. And so um, we've trained over the last year, 1400 people have paid us to do, um, to come and do a six week course on Tuesdays and you can do it in person in LA or online, really beautifully well set up you know, online or and from 25 countries. Um, and now we have advocates taking on projects you know, all over the world wow. that are lit up about this possibility, the possibility of regeneration, regenerative agriculture, and, you know, things like, you know, the Rodell Institute, uh, which is one of the longest standing kind of mm-hmm. organic, um, it's actually, they coined the term regenerative many, many years ago. Um, you know, we got a call from the executive director, um, Jeff Foyer, saying, you know, we've been doing this for 50 years and I kept on here and kissed the ground, advocacy, like, you know, the way you're communicating is, is working. People are getting it. They're getting inspired. Um, and we got another call from another woman who's in the course right now saying, you know, I, I used to be an environmentalist raising millions of dollars and kind of just gave up. And now with this paradigm shift and understanding of regeneration that we can actually reverse the damage done. And mm. it, it, it's actually, you know, we're already in manipulation and management of the skin of the earth, the majority of the skin through agriculture. Mm-hmm. And we can actually, I, I can see how that healing can actually be a solution for, you know, the, the crisis that we're in. And so, um, you know, it's just, in, so we're, we're basically training people to, um, to be advocates. We're also, you know, Jeff from a commune, uh, Jeff Krasno, yeah. Wonderlust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we did a free course on Commune um, that's coming out. Um, uh, I can look up the date. Cool. Did you shoot it up in the up in Topanga at his uh, spot? We shot up, there? up, in, up in Topanga. It's pretty exactly. cool up there. Isn't super, it? super cool. Um, and so that is um, that's happening. It's a free ten day course, um, September 9th uh-huh. um, on onecommune.com. Um, so yeah, we're basically, we have two programs. We're, we're training advocates um, to be, prof- be professional, um, spokespeople on behalf of soil regenerative agriculture, and then you know, giving people pathways to participate in their own communities and how they can you know, take action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other big problem project that we're doing is a farmland training program, where we're basically uh, sponsoring farmers 
uh, a three-year program. So for 8,000 bucks, we can take a farmer with you know 10 acres to 5,000 acres and basically put them through a three-year training program that has an in-person course and then consulting through the three year the three years and a soil test to know their baseline, you know where they're at with their soil health, and then at uh, oh, wow. three years, and so you know people you can fund you can fund a farmer through our work, and that basically facilitates oh, a farmer cool. to go through that transition process. That's super cool. Um, so yeah, those are our, those are our main two programs: is is is, is training farmers um, and training advocates to really be um, you know the. Because we, you know, we understand that to shift a paradigm, you have to have, you know, early adopters, and then when you get like fourteen percent, uh-huh. uh, you know, then you can kind of get this bigger. So we're, we're we're seeing, you know, again, even speaking here on on your on your show is kind of like how do I, you know, connect to influential people, get this to become their narrative and a, a story mm-hmm. that they're carrying, um, where they speak and they communicate, as well as training, you know, any individual in a more long term. Right. Um, and then the final thing is we've been uh, co-producing a feature-length film um, with Josh and Rebecca Tikal, the filmmakers who made the film Fuel mm. uh, that won at Sundance about 10 years ago. And the film is called Kiss the Ground, mm-hmm. and it's showing some of the best examples uh, nationally in this country of regenerative agriculture being done at scale and showing the you know, incredible results of you know, what people are experiencing uh, from you know e- ecosystem restoration as well as from the economic opportunity. Yeah, the interesting thing is how quickly it turns around, right? Yeah. Like how how rapid you you when done right, how rapid it you can regenerate the soil and create biodiversity in in the ground and the impact that it, that that has on water absorption and you know a whole litany of things that have downstream impact on improving our environmental health. Yeah, I mean, when you heal the soil, you heal the uh, the ability for water to um, recharge our aquifers. Which right. Right now. Right now, it just runs off. Runs off. Goes, goes into, into our tributaries and into our waterways. Creates these algal blooms. It's terrible. Terrible. Um, so you're 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 recharging aquifers. You're uh, you're putting nutrient dense food on people's plates. You're getting rid of. Um, you know, ke- all the chemical inputs that are being, um, that are, you know, ultimately going downstream as you just described. Um, and you're, and you're, you're creating a regeneration of, you know, an economic system um, for farmers who are, you know, essentially dying. I mean, they're, they're literally struggling massively. Um, so, it, you know, it's such a, it's such a win-win situation. And that's why, you know, when I, when it, when it, when I saw it and I just got it, it was just like, wow, this is what my life is for. Mm-hmm. And um, who was the one farmer who was saying he was getting 0.5% to 1%? Uh, Al, Al, Alan Williams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, remarkable. In three year period on a 5,000 acre ranch, he was able to uh, triple his forage. So basically, he was able to bring. Uh, grassland that was very spotty and almost kind of desertifying, basically tripled the amount of um, grasses and basically um, through his um, adaptive rotational grazing of of animals, of, of cows, um, he was able to basically regenerate the, the forage, uh, which is the food for the cows, three times such that he could have three times more cattle on that on that piece, of, on that one piece of land, so ultimately, you know, the neighbors is like spotty, almost, you know, completely desertified, growing corn and soy, and he's taken a land that's been that that over so many years, and then um, every year putting somewhere between uh, four to ten tons of carbon sequestered in the ground able to produce more food per acre because mm-hmm. he's tripled, um, he's, he's basically tripled his forage uh, on, on that land. Um, and so he's totally, you know, his, his, his the ecosystem services have been regenerated, his, his the economic opportunity has been regenerated. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the, we're just in an orthodoxy that is, you know, we need chemicals, we need big ag, we need uh, these to feed the planet, to feed the world. 
And, you know, as we, as we, you know, train farmers and create communities of farmers, because to, to have multiple farmers in an area together having a success, then that becomes a very powerful symbol and uh, reputation for people to, you know, maybe make that transition. Because right. as, as, as are all people, you know, we're all, we're all stubborn in our own ways. We think mm-hmm. we've been doing things the right way and it's hard to change. Right. Um, Speaking of, of, of stubborn, like how do you, how do you square philosophically this work that you're doing with Kiss the Ground with the fact that you're like an impresario of the plant-based lifestyle and vegan, this vegan restaurant empire. Like, you know, part of me feels like I get it, but also like, let's move away from the cows. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm sure you're on the receiving end of criticism, like, hey, you're supposed to be this vegan guy, but you're talking about sequestering carbon in these farms by virtue of grazing, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you think about that or respond to that? Yeah, I mean, that's been a big, um, that's been a big um, dilemma. I mean, I don't know if you remember, we, there was this whole yeah. kind of- There was um, big controversy. Big controversy. Yeah. We had six weeks of um, protests and people you know, saying my family are murderers and um, it was intense. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the thing that we as human beings, um, the thing that we most dislike is when people know new information but continue to lie to your face based on, you know, it's good for business to do that. This was not good for business to tell the story of, hey, we went, we, we moved to, we, we, we went to open Be Love Farm as raw food vegans. And we were, you know, figuring out how to grow vegetables for our vegan restaurant, realizing, wow, to grow vegan vegetables, we need remnants of animals, nitrogen, uh, manure, either coming from a CAFO situation of, you know, a really terrible situation or, you know, blood meal, bone meal, uh, fish emulsion, and, you know, reckoning like, wow, a lot of these vegetables that you know, we're, you know, making up our vegan diet are coming from the fertilization of the decomposition of dead animals. Mm-hmm. And so that was like a big kind of shocker. Um, and there's no way to grow those vegetables otherwise in a scalable way. I mean, there's, 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 there's agriculture called veganic agriculture, mm-hmm. which, you know, I think it's a beautiful, you know, I, th- I think that people have made that their, like their, their, their edge and th- they're doing it. Um, but if you look to biodynamics and, you know, all the, all the organic pioneers of agriculture um, that really were thinking in holism and whole cycle systems and really seeing how do we make agriculture mimic nature? Because most monoculture or grain or vegetable production is tilled monoculture, vegetables, grains, legumes. And essentially the way you fertilize that is you work in partnership with animals to graze over that and re-fertilize. But again, inside of you know, everything has to bring something to the table. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people are farmers, they're, you know, they're, they're cultivating food to have it be a, a way that they can cultivate food as well as an economic opportunity. You know, for us, it was like, all right, we, we saw we'd rather steward cows and have them be able to eat our grass and fertilize our soil versus getting um, CAFO manure from down the road or fish emulsion from Lake Superior. Or, uh, and, you know, some people eat meat on the farm, some people, and it just felt like, all right, we're, we're humbly learning how to grow organic food in the most sustainable or regenerative way, looking to the forefathers of that wisdom and what we're understanding and what makes sense. Oh, wow, there is this architecture of life and death that's mm-hmm. always been in nature that has cycling nutrients. 
And while there is life and death in that, in that system, there's overall a, uh, a proliferation of more life and life continues not as a, um, you know, not like there's not individuals that die, but the overall system um, remains healthy and continues to rejuvenate itself. And so, you know, as we walk through that process ourselves and, you know, my dad had been 40 year vegetarian, I had been vegetarian for 35 years and I'm still mostly, I, I live mostly, you know, 90% uh, a plant-based lifestyle uh, and eat plant-based diet because it's what I've eaten for my life and I feel good on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I hope people would honor that we, we, we went to learn how to do it you know, and do it ourselves and, and growing food and what we came to, to create this 21 acres of, you know, and, and to have this continual regenerative effect, it was going to require, you know, the, the, the grazing of animals and uh, the, the fertilization of those animals and to, um, to pay for the cost of that, you know, whether it's they bring milk to the table as a, an income opportunity or meat or bone, um, you know, there's, you know, everything has to, you know, every, in, in a farming system, we're harvesting crops to sell it. And it's kind of the, yeah. the, the system. Um, so, you know, I, I get what felt like a really, um, hard, almost betrayal from like, Hey, you guys were the vegan family. And, um, and, and I, and I get that there's like the, this disappointment when you feel like you, someone embody something or you think they embody something and this is what they represent for you. And then they say, Hey, I changed my mind or I, I'm doing something different. Um, but again, I would, I would just hope that people would have to respect that, you know, we're just telling the truth of what we're learning mm-hmm. and, um, we're in our process of understanding what is, um, the, the best way to care for, um, you know, this living planet and have it be, um, continuously alive and, and vital. And, you know, in that system, death has always been a part of that. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, certainly I'm no expert on on agriculture and farming and, and these issues, but I think as humans, we have this impulse to be reductive in our reasoning. And, you know, the vegan community obviously didn't, there was a portion of it that didn't embrace this, <laughs> you know, this this fact as, uh, you know, as welcoming as, as I would think that you would have wished. Um, and it's hard, you know, I think life and issues like this are more complicated and, and nuanced. And Much again, more. it goes back to telescoping out and trying to look at these things from 10,000 feet and grappling with, you know, what the best possible solution is. I mean, if you're, you can be the most ardent, hardcore, militant vegan of all time, but if you're, you know, consuming a ridiculous amount of single use plastics, I mean, I just saw a news article, I think it was yesterday that it was snowing plastic in the Arctic. Like, then are you really in the solution? Like there's always more things that we can do. Uh, we all have blind spots. And sometimes the the truth of these matters is a little bit more nuanced and complicated than than we would wish it to be. Totally. Yeah. Uh, you know, de- I mean, this was this was terrible for business to like you know yeah. share this story. We were like boycotted, and there were all kinds of articles about this when it happened. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it was. But super- but then you know, telescoping out, like you're the guys who are who are serving up more plant based meals than almost anybody on the planet. So right. are you in the solution? Or are you in the problem? You know, these, these answers are, are not there. You know, there's a lot of gray. It's not everything is black and white. Totally. Right. And again, we, you know, five, 10 years from now, you know, I, I hope there'll be an evolution in the story of, you know, that I'm telling and, you know, what we've continued to learn as we've explored down this path and understanding um, the, the process of regeneration and, and the, you know, the importance of animals in that system. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just what, what we understand, uh, at this point. And, um, you know, I, I, and I, I hope that I continue to be able to, 
tell the truth about the process mm -hmm. of well, learning. Well, there's certainly plenty that we can all agree on, and that is that we are running out of time, that we are definitely in the midst of a insane cataclysmic environmental crisis, that actions need to be taken. They need to be taken swiftly and intelligently. We do need to reduce our, our, you know, our meat consumption, our plastic consumption. We need to live more sustainably and we need to live more in rhythm with nature's you know, gestalt. And we've moved so far away from that. And I'm heartened by um, the younger generations Desire to live more purpose-driven lives, and and the care that 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 you know people younger than myself tend to tend to take for the planet that my generation has failed to do so, and so I remain hopeful and optimistic, but also tentative because so much work remains to be done. Do you know uh, Charles Eisenstein? Has he ever been on your show? Uh. -uh. You know his name or no? Mm, it sounds familiar. He Who wrote is that? two beautiful books, one called The Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible, mm. and then one called Climate, A New Story. Um, but a really beautiful philosopher, thinker, like a, a modern day yeah. brilliant mind of our time. Um, and you know, he, he quotes Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, term of interbeing, um, which really I think to, you know, as far as how do we, um, how do we live in reverence and appreciation and understanding that um, we are all part of a life and death cycle and how can we be grateful and appreciative, you know, whether it's plants or animals that, you know, die and we consume to create our life, how can we live in reverence and appreciation of that, that process mm -hmm. of uh, life and death is the architecture of this universe. And every time we do have a meal, whether it is plants or animals and you know, even the best vegan meal required you know, uh, a, a system of cropping that ultimately killed lots of beings. And um, you know, can we be in reverence of um, you know, that we engage and uh, are participating in this universe with that architecture? And can we be grateful and do our best to make sure that we're caring for um, those things that we um, require along the way and that those that require, um, you know, that we require to consume and to, to, you know, sustain our lives. And I think there's a beautiful quote by a guy named Wendell Berry, who's kind of a godfather of uh, natural farming. And um, he's also a poet. And he said, every day we break the body and spill the blood of creation. If we do it knowingly, carefully and reverently, it is a sacrament. If we do it with greed, gluttony, and carelessness, it is a desecration. Hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that to me, the big, the big wake up is it's not just, um, you know, it, it's not just one thing. It's, it's, it's our relationship to all things. And how do we live more in an awareness of interconnection and awareness of gratitude for everything that supports our life. And then when we are grateful for it, um, you know, the inclination is to care for it mm -hmm. and want it to have its best expression of life that it can have. Hence, uh, kiss the ground, which comes from Rumi. That's right. Which the my, name of your child. The name of my child, yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. What is the full quote? Uh, the full quote is, let the beauty you love be all that you do. There's hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Beautiful. I think that's a good place to round this out. Awesome. Um, thank you for the work that you do and that you continue to do. Uh, it's been inspiring uh, being in your orbit over the years. I can't remember when we first met. It was many years ago. We just continued to cross paths in our Friend circle definitely overlaps, and I can always count on a hug from you when I walk into the restaurant. You're not always there, but you're there quite. You're you're there more than I would suspect, right? Totally, yes. Um, 
and, uh, and with everything that you're doing with Kiss the Ground. So if people are listening and they wanna learn more and get involved with Kiss the Ground, what's yeah, the so best way we'd, to do we'd that? We'd love everyone to become a soil advocate. It's the new environmental movement. Rege- it is. Be the gen- regeneration generation, the regeneration generation. So yeah, our soil advocacy training, you can find that on kissetheground.com. Uh, follow us on IG, Instagram, Kiss the Ground, at Kiss the Ground. And then uh, fund a farmer if you're inspired by this story. And uh, we just got, you know, someone just, we just got an anonymous uh, fund a farmer, $8,000 arrived this morning nice. from someone who just said, wow, I want to fund a farmer um, towards regeneration. So uh, for 8,000 um, bucks, we can have a farmer um, be on the path to regenerating their land. And uh, it's very, it's very cool. exciting. It's similar to Farmer's Footprint a little bit. The, yeah, we're, we're actually their are... fiscal sponsor. Oh, you are? Uh, oh, for, okay, cool. Uh, so we're very connected yeah, yeah, and tied yeah. in with Zach Bush and uh, their whole team and stuff. Yeah, so. nice, man. And what's coming up on the horizon? Uh, what's coming up on the horizon? Let's see. Uh, Kiss the Ground Wise, the feature length film narrated by Woody Harrelson. Uh, When's that coming out? Uh, last quarter of this year. So uh-huh. we're still working on what's the distribution plan for it. Um, but the film is done. Uh, so very, very excited about that. Um, the, yeah, please, we have um, a couple more soil advocacy trainings this year. So jump in that. Um, and as I said, fun to farmer. And then on the Cafe Gratitude front, we have a uh, Meatless Mondays, which is kind of like, well, why are you guys Meatless Mondays? You're meatless every day. But <laughs> our, we're, we're, we're basically encouraging omnivores and carnivores to come and have a great plant-based experience and we'll pick up half the tab. So we basically every week wow. at all of our restaurants, we have two or three items or two items that are 50% off uh, as a way to encourage, you know, for uh, everybody, uh, or, or only if you declare yourself to be an omnivore. No, no, no. For everybody, but you, 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 I mean, you have to you have to join our uh, lo- loyalty program. But basically, um, yeah, every Monday, and we've in, I've encouraged Tokai to take it on, and they they might jump mm. on. Sage might take it on cool. as a way to yeah. I mean, Meatless Mondays is a you know uh, it's a it's a cool way to shift the collective consciousness to have you know one day a week where we say all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of my body and I'm gonna take care of the planet by not consuming, you know, you know what is oftentimes the most destructive food on the planet. So, cool. um, and then another cool thing, um, we're doing a partnership with Jaden Smith. Uh, nice. It's kind of an upgrade to the Gratitude Bowl. Uh-huh. Uh, it's called the I Love You Bowl, and it's going to be a, a dish that'll be kind of his favorite, you know, meal in a bowl, a pink bowl, which is kind of his color. And it will say, I love you on the bottom of the bowl. And for every bowl that you buy in the restaurant, we'll feed one homeless meal, that same bowl off of his truck. Cause he has, a, he has a truck called yeah. I love you bowl. He calls, he's got the, I love you truck. I love you. I was restaurant. wondering whether you guys might be behind that. Uh, so yeah, it, you know, he, he said there was parts of it that were inspired by Cafe Gratitude, but when I saw him do it, I called him and he was like, let's do this. Yeah. And so we're now in the development and we're, we're, we're aiming to launch it the last quarter of the year and hopefully serve 10,000 bowls so we can give away 10,000 bowls. That's cool. That's uh, amazing. How cool is that kid? So Unbelievable! Cool. What a what a bright, heart centered yeah. human being. Present that whole family. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so that's happening. Uh, we're doing. We're collaborating with Mark Hyman. We're doing a, a one week uh, sugar free uh, detox. So five days starting in September, September fifteenth, and then the following week uh, you can do five days. It's going to be like fifty or sixty five dollars a day, and all your nourishment for the day. Really well curated, yummy plant-based, amazing, nutrient-dense food, uh, minus sugar, and you get to see how you feel uh, after um, you know, going a week, no sugar. So that's, that's happening. And, uh, and then Thanksgiving's coming up. Uh, we'll do our, our, our free Thanksgiving again. Mm-hmm. We're gonna do it at the Venice location. That's gonna be happening. Uh, so please come down for a really, really beautiful, heart-centered community. Thanksgiving, we have live music, and it's just a total a place to belong. You feel like you belong. So come for that. And um, yeah, I love you and thanks for listening. And uh, thanks Rich for this amazing opportunity to share. I love you too, Ryland. Uh, Thank you for sharing. You are amazingly grounded and centered and present and calm amidst all the amazing things that you're doing, which is a whole other podcast conversation that we could have (laughs) uh, about how you comport yourself in the world. Um, But I respect you so much. 
Uh, I'm in awe of what you've created, and uh, it's an honor to talk to you today. So thanks, man. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, websites, all that kind of stuff, kiss the ground. Yeah. Um, Send it to you finding or we'll you. Write down now? No, just tell me where, pe oh, where cool. people can go directly. Yeah, so Love Being Ryland is my... Uh, that's actually my uh, my my first abounding river board game name. Mm. Love being Ryland, so it's an abundance word, a spirit word in my name, and I chose it as my Instagram handle because I'm a love yeah. being. Uh, love being <laughs> Ryland is my personal Instagram, uh, and at Cafe Gratitude, at Gracias Madre, at Gratitude Kitchen and Bar, which are our third restaurant. Actually, that's another cool thing that's happening is uh, we just hired a brand new chef for the Gratitude in Beverly Hills, and we're gonna kind of totally revolutionize that menu. Oh, nice. Um, so it'll be not kind of, it'll, I mean, it'll be foundationally gratitude quality ingredients, but like on the next level culinary uh -huh. expression, a guy named Jason Wood. So really excited about that. Um, um, and then as far as Instagram, it's at, uh, at kissetheground, um, kissetheground.com is, you know, that the website there. Um, and then I said cafegratitude.com, graciasmadre.com, and gratitudekitchenandbar.com. And I think that is... Uh, yeah. I think that's it. I think we did it. We did it. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel great. You feel good? I feel great. We yeah. did good, right? Yeah, I thought, I thought it was really... Yeah, I, I was I was concerned how the whole meat conversation was going to come up. And, it's tricky. Yeah, but uh, uh, we had a, we had a, we had a, the only way out is through, my yeah, friend. Totally, and we walked through it. Totally. No, so. it felt it felt it felt it felt honoring and 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 responsible and um, truthful and uh, yeah. All right, cool. We'll come back and talk to me again sometime. Amazing. All right. Uh, I just I just I figured I'd tell you this news. <laughs> I was just in uh, Orcas Island this past weekend. Yeah. For the first time, beautiful place, by the way. But I talked to Mike Posner while I was there. And oh, the you did? The last time I talked. Get it I, on the mic. I got to hear this. Oh, Keep wait, going. Okay, cool. You talked to Mike before uh, or after the rattlesnake bite? After the rattlesnake. You did. Yeah, uh -huh. after the rattlesnake bite. He told me He told me play by play the whole story. I mean, it's, it's a, a miraculous story. I mean, he is like hurting, dude. Like he got, I mean, you see the video of him and you're like, this is not, no, oh, no joke. This is, yeah, could be a month plus of recovery. Right. Um, and yeah, just beauty. He's in a, an amazing space about it. Uh, he, he, you know, he sees the opportunity to, he sees it as the perfect temptation for giving up or stopping right. or having total justification. Um, but the positivity with which he's he's walking through this is so impactful for everybody that loves and follows him because they're totally. like, look at this guy, like look what happened to him, and still he checks in every single day and he's like happy and forward looking and all of that, and it's it's like I aspire to that. Yeah, he is level he is of a, character, a, a beautiful being. And uh, he's doing great, and he's going to walk it out. And I'm going to I'm going to meet him in Venice uh, for his final his final stretch. Are you? Me and I'll, him, I'll join him, you. I, I was thinking of flying out and joining him for a you know for, part of the walk. Oh, awesome! Um, yeah, I, I hadn't. I hadn't even thought of it. up before the bite yeah. though. I'm like, this dude is taking his time. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's still like in the middle of the country. How long is this going to go on for? You know, he could be out there for like an entire year at yeah. this point. I, I think his. I think he. What he, how many, I think he's what thirty days, thirty or sixty days from after after he comes back from uh -huh. two months, right? Thirty one one or two months, I think. Um, but I know in Q, you know, in Q, the poet, yeah, yeah, yeah. a good friend of his, and yeah. he's gonna meet him on 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 Lincoln or something to do the final stretch. So oh I'm gonna, well, I'm, I'm definitely gonna, there I'm for gonna, that. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'd love to do that final stretch with him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, All right, cool. Yeah, but it, it came up because the last podcast I listened to of your show was his, with his was his mm -hmm. episode with you, which yeah. is awesome. He's the best. Um, yeah, so amazing. Cool. All right. All Beautiful. right, man. 